Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. You could subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite download service, and never miss the great content we offer. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Genevieve Lester, DeSario Chair of Strategic Intelligence here at the U.S. Army War College. Thanks for joining us for today's program. I'm joined today by Director James Clapper, who is a retired Lieutenant General in the United States Air Force and the former Director of National Intelligence. Prior to his role as DNI, he held several key positions within the United States intelligence community, including Director of a Defense Intelligence Agency and Director of National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, in addition to a range of intelligence roles in the Air Force. Director Clapper joins us today to talk about issues of intelligence, accountability, and politics. So welcome, Director Clapper. Thanks for having me, Jen. So given your 50 years of experience in the intelligence community, I, we're excited to get your impressions of current happenings in the intelligence world. So I just wanted to start off with uh, many of us have been interested in, in the developments in the ODNI right now and um, kind of wondering what's happening, if that role is changing, uh, the impact of politics. Do you mind just talking about that a little bit? Well, yes, sure. Um, first of all, uh, as a just a, a broad statement, Anytime you have as much uh, leadership turbulence as uh, the Office of Director of National Intelligence and in turn the entire intelligence community is is enduring right now, it's not good. The lack of continuity uh, uh, is uh, the instability and the turmoil that's, that happens whenever there is change, but it's uh, so frequent now. And so they've had one uh, confirmed director and two happenings now in the space of about uh, three years. And, uh, you know, that's just not good for the system. And, of course, the other concern that that, uh, I have, and as do many uh, intelligence professionals, is the the apparent attempt to politicize uh, the position of DNI by installing a stalwart loyalist. And I would argue that uh, it's much better to have a, a professional, someone who has served in the intelligence community to be in that position. Uh, it appears to me, from you know, what I hear, that uh, what is underway now is something of a purge and, uh, you know, to prevent the exposure of inconvenient truths uh, to the president, notably on the subject of, of Russian interference, which I think is not good for the safety and security uh, of the um of the country. Now, it's true, I have to point out and acknowledge that a policymaker, any policymaker, to include policymaker number one, always has the option of accepting or rejecting or ignoring the intelligence that he or she has presented. But I would offer that doing that repetitively, perpetually, over a long period of time is, is dangerous. So I'm very concerned about what's happening right now. Um, with uh, uh, the situation there at, at uh, ODNI, and it, it obviously has uh, negative impacts on, on morale. So, very interesting. Um, you, you say dangerous, and I just want to unpack that a little bit. What, what are some of the outcomes you could see happening from, from this, from politics, from the transitory leadership? Can you give us a sense? Well, let's, suppo- let's, suppo- let's suppose, just, this is purely hypothetical, obviously, but let's suppose, God forbid, we evolve into a... Uh, some sort of nuclear confrontation with Russia. So if uh, people are um, reluctant or afraid to bring news to the president that he doesn't particularly want to hear because he wants to get along with Russia and kind of uh, look the other way, uh, that's not a good thing. That's not a good development. That's not, that's not good for the country. Um, but the country, the president... And all policymakers should have, you know, the, the unvarnished truth as best the intelligence community can serve it up. So if you're going to misrepresent or distort or taint 
or just not report on uh, negative situations around the world to the president, that puts, uh, to me, puts the country in peril. That makes a lot of sense in the dissemination phase. Do you think what's going on right now is having an impact on the analytic work of the intelligence community? Uh, just from your perspective on this, if morale issues or, or are there cultural changes happening? I don't actually know. Um, I think if you're an intelligence analyst on a portfolio that uh, isn't necessarily politically sensitive to the president, it probably doesn't have any impact on you. But if you're working North Korea or Iran or Russia or China, uh, I I worry about not so much a blatant uh, hiding, you know, stowing in the in the desk drawer what people would recognize as bad news for the president. I worry about the subtleties here, the nuances of uh, slanting or uh, softening uh, s- some bad news. And and again, that that is that's not good. I can't say that that's going on. I don't have any proof of that. No one's told me that that's happening, but I, I do worry about it. Oh, thank you for your input on that. Uh, sort of just going back a little bit to the ODNI. I mean, we've all seen the role of the of um, Admiral McGuire in the impeachment process and how that was kicked off by the whistleblower claim. Would Would you say, in, in in terms of oversight, that the system worked when it came to how the whistleblower was dealt with within the process of intelligence and oversight? Well, it eventually. It did, obviously. I mean, the, the, the whistleblower complaint was the um, catalyst for the ensuing events. Uh, you know, the congressional, at least the House inquiry and, and the impeachment process and the trial. So uh, I guess in that sense, uh, it it worked, I guess I'd have to say in quotes, because uh, there was a bump in the road initially when uh, uh, Alan McGuire, uh, acting director McGuire, uh, referred the um, whistleblower complaint to the Department of Justice, who not surprisingly said, well, there's no need to report to the Congress. Eventually, it did find its way to, to the Congress, uh, which is the uh, certainly the, an attempt of the law governing whistleblowing uh, in the intelligence community. Great. Uh, so shifting our attention a little bit to intelligence and oversight and the relationship between the community and congressional oversight committees, can you talk a little bit about how that has changed in, in, in the course of the last few years? Well, I was in the intelligence community way back in the in the 70s. I was a young pup assigned to uh, NSA when, and this is, you know, post-Vietnam, um, uh, went through all that trauma. And all the ab- abuses that the intelligence community engaged in, mainly using uh, foreign intelligence apparatus to, to spy on citizens uh, domestically. So that was the first pike hearings, which in turn led to the uh, establishment of the two oversight committees, the House Permanent Committee on Intelligence, which I think was like 1976 or so, and the following year, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. So now there are dedicated committees in each house of the Congress to oversee intelligence. And when the committees began, uh, my first direct exposure to them was in the early 80s, and the the basic approach that virtually all members took was that this was a sacred national trust, this is something I'm doing for the country, not for my home district or home state or my party. Over time, that that premise has kind of eroded, and now the the committees have the same partisan pressures as as the rest of the, of the Congress, and for that matter, the country. And it's been my experience that when the committee is acting, behaving on a bipartisan basis, it is far more effective and far more credible in the eyes of the intelligence community. Oversight for intelligence is really important. Because it's not like the Department of Commerce or, or Health and Human Services or other cabinet departments, which largely operate in the open. They're transparent. Intelligence, in contrast, just because of its nature and the need to protect sources and methods, cannot operate fully transparently like everybody else. That's why the intelligence oversight committees have a, a special responsibility and a heavier burden, I would submit, 
undo their counterparts and colleagues on other committees because they have to act as surrogates for the American public to ensure that what the intelligence community is doing is legal, moral, and ethical. So when we're looking through your comment uh, um, a little earlier in the discussion about the sort of the norm of bipartisanship when it came to the oversight committees, do you think looking at those institutions, and, and you've obviously seen them over, develop over the course of decades, do you think there will ever be a return to bipartisanship, to the, the sense that politics stops at the water's edge and all of those other expectations of those those committees? Well, it's been, the history has been cyclical. Because, um, I, I, you know, I can recall uh, periods, uh, especially in the House, where the, uh, depending on the the politics of the day, it was highly partisan. And that, that, that is the case now with the, the House of Representatives Committee for Intelligence. In contrast, the Senate Intelligence Committee has operated, even in the charged era we're in now, has operated largely on a bipartisan basis. And I think that has, it, it says a lot about the efforts that uh, Senator Richard Burr and the Republican from North Carolina and the vice chairman, uh, Mark Warner, is a, re- a Democrat from Virginia, and they have operated together and uh, tried to sustain, largely successfully, I think, uh, an or a bipartisanship uh, in the committee. And as a consequence, I think they're far more effective and far more credible right now than, than the House, which is a very partisan. Oh, absolutely. So just continuing on with this theme of, of accountability, openness, there's been a discussion lately about the worldwide threat briefing. That has generally been an open, more open type event where the intelligence community gets to talk about a prioritization of threats um, to a wider audience. And it's looking like that openness is being closed down a little bit in the current environment. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, um, if perceptions are correct or if politics are playing a role or really what those parameters are. Well, this is somewhat uh, another manifestation of what we talked about uh, earlier, um, and that is the portraying, uh, the conveying, the communicating of news that uh, this president doesn't necessarily want to hear. So in February of last year, when then uh, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coates, uh, along with the other intelligence community leaders, briefed the Senate Intelligence Committee, and said things that were, you know, very consistent with intelligence community positions, and and he was he represented intelligence community positions on the on the likes of Russia and North Korea, uh, whether ISIS had been destroyed or not, and Iranian uh, compliance at the time with the Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA. Well, the president took exception to that and attacked uh, the intelligence leaders for having reported what they believed is the truth and uh, certainly consistent with uh, Intelligence Committee-wide positions. And apparently the president didn't like that, so I I guess what happened here, I don't have any inside baseball, is that the Office of Director of National Intelligence approached the Congress about not having an open session and only having a closed session to avoid any... uh, rough edges, if you will, any friction with the president. Well, the, the point of having those open hearings, which I always dreaded and found very painful, but I also recognize the necessity of having them, was so that the American public could see who the intelligence community leaders are and what they have to say about uh, the press around the world. And it's, a, it's an awkward uh, situation because... You try to be responsive and informative, but at the same time, mindful of the need to protect sources and methods. So it's, I always found it to be a very uncomfortable process, but one that is, I think, very necessary. And and we've lost a degree of transparency when uh, the intelligence community does not appear publicly, even once a year, uh, to give its best depiction of the threats facing the United States. Oh, thank you for that insight on that. I think it leads into my next question of, of really with the relationship between intellig- the intelligence community and that apparatus and the public. Because I think that we've seen some challenging of intelligence outcomes and um, 
assessments by the current administration. And what is your sense of, of how the public responds to these things? Do, do you think it matters? Do you think that these issues have a lot of traction in the public space? Well, uh, that's a great question. And I honestly don't know. I suspect for large parts of the country and large segments of the population, it may not matter very much. It doesn't affect, uh, in the minds of many people, kind of day-to-day uh, breakfast table uh, issues like health care and educa- you know, education and paying off student loans and things like that. So I, I'm not sure uh, it uh, uh, affects uh, a large segment uh, of the population. It's unfortunate, but I think that's part of the case. Uh, along those lines, I, I think. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. I think that um, a lot of us um, are thinking about, for example, the coronavirus right now and epidemics and strategic communication. And is there a, a way that intelligence plays into that discussion, the discussion of disease and that type of thing? Oh, absolutely. Um, I thought in the last administration when I served as a uh, DNI that when the Ebola crisis uh, emerged, that that meant there were going to be a lot of meetings at the White House that I wouldn't have to go to. Well, that wasn't the case. Intelligence has an extremely important role to play. I'll give you one good example of one of my old agencies, uh, NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. They did fantastic work in projecting the movement of Ebola affections just based on known transportation uh, uh, patterns, LOCs, and the cultural behavior of the countries that were affected. And only the intelligence community could do that. And as well, there's this, there's another uh, aspect here of, you know, kind of keeping uh, either country, nation states, or international organizations honest to ensure that what they were saying publicly or recording to or sharing with the U.S. government was actually the case and that they weren't sort of uh, gilding, the, gilding the lily to, to try to create the impression that things were better in their respective country than they actually were. So it shows us as a, as a big role to play. Well, that's fascinating. I don't think we tend to think of intelligence as playing that kind of a role in public health and other issues. And I, I think that a wider audience for those skills would, would, would be helpful right now, especially when it's public is not really sure whether to panic or not, whether to cancel all their trips. Well, this is one case where the old adage in intelligence, it's, it's something of a simplistic bumper sticker perhaps, but it, it does convey uh, a very important tenet, and that is truth to power. And when you're talking about disease and epidemics or worse, pandemics, this is one case where truth and transparency are, are all important. And, uh, you know, you need to avoid the politicization because facts are really important. This is literally a matter of life and death. Absolutely. And I think um, it's an interesting place we're in right now. I think we're at an inflection point, as particularly as we've just seen within the last 20 hours or so, Mr. Ratcliffe being nominated to be the next permanent director of national intelligence do you have any thoughts on that, where we're headed? I know we started out here, but what is the way forward, do you think? In the first place, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure this is a serious nomination. You know, he was floated as the nominee last July, which elicited uh, bipartisan negative blowback from the, from the Hill. So as a consequence, he withdrew uh, from being nominated to be a DNI. So I don't, I don't as, as Senator Warner tweeted, but after this came out, you know, what's changed since last July? And to, as far as I know, nothing. So I do wonder about uh, a situation uh, prompted by the vagaries of the Federal Appointments Vacancy Act. Uh, and the situation here was that uh, Acting Director McGuire's, as, as an acting, his term was up, would have been up in, on March 11th. Uh, meaning uh, 210 days, which is the period stipulated uh, in the Vacancy Act. So by naming a nominee, whether it's it's serious or not, that then restarts the time clock for Ambassador Grinnell. 
So now instead of just ending up on March 11th, he potentially has another 210 days if there's no confirmation. So I, this is kind of a cynical uh, analysis here, but I, I just wonder whether the White House is attempting to, to avoid any confirmation hearing for any DNI until after the election. Well, that's a very interesting point. And just to follow up on being cynical, as I may be myself, um, do you think this is a gesture that the administration is that the the White House is sending to the intelligence community in terms of power or control or or anything along those lines? Well, absolutely. I think uh, by naming as acting director two people who are clearly par- uh, partisan, clearly staunch, staunch supporters of of. Um, uh, of the president, and they are uh, emblematic that uh, loyalty, personal loyalty, is much more important than uh, experience, expertise, or competence. And so that that message has clearly been conveyed to uh, the intelligence community. And I think that the, the implicit message here is that the intelligence community better behave and uh, you know mind its knitting and and not bring up anything that displeases the president. I think that's the message. What do you think about? Pushing, with the intelligence community pushing back on that, do you think that's a possibility, or is this 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 the the message they're, they're being sent complete? Well, the, the price for the, the apparent price for pushing back is was if you lose your job. And we're seeing examples of that. People are going to think about that, I, I'm sure, before uh, they uh, stick up for principle. So, just as we wrap up our. our discussion here just what is your sense of of the intelligence community going forward do we have space for optimism in terms of dealing with new threats dealing with epidemics pandemics also the cyber threat that remains ambiguous what is your overall takeaway i don't really know uh how the intelligence community is going to um fare here um i i i'm I'm very concerned about it um so I, i i can't say i would like to think that for the most part, uh, everybody's going to uh, do their job and do what's right, and that has not, you know, been the normal tradition in intelligence community that, you know, report whatever we see, even if it's inconvenient. Uh, so I, I don't know how much that has been uh, tempered or, or how much of that will be inhibited by the obvious message that the White House is conveying by uh, appointing these two very partisan acting directors. Or the acting director and the acting director and the nominee. I'm sorry, excuse me. Director Clapper, thank you so much for joining us today. You've really illustrated a lot of the difficulties that the community and I think oversight and, and all of us are really thinking about right now in terms of current affairs and threats that seem very uncomfortable right now. So it's particularly the pandemic, those types of things. So thank you again for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.com. Dot armywarcollege.edu and have a great day.